the axial skeleton. The manubrium. This is a quadrangular shaped bone located on the superior component of the sternum. It is broader superiorly and narrower inferiorly. The manubrium articulates laterally with the clavicles and the first two ribs. Palpate the superior border with your finger and feel the suprasternal notch. This is central and anterior to the trachea. The sternoclavicular joints can be identified by elevating and depressing the shoulders. Palpate the manubriosternal joint or angle of Lewis. Run your fingers over this ridge. This is a useful anatomical landmark as it is at the level of the second costal cartilage. The body of the sternum. The sternum is a flat elongated bone. It forms the middle portion of the anterior wall of the thorax. Superiorly, it is joined to the manubrium at the level of the second costal cartilage. Inferiorly, it is joined with the xiphoid process at the level of the seventh costal cartilage. Laterally, it articulates with the costal cartilages of ribs 2 to 7. It has a slightly convex shape and it is about 17 centimeters long. The xiphoid process. The xiphoid process or xiphoid sternum is a small pointed projection at the end of the sternum. Initially it is cartilaginous and between the ages of 15 to 19 it ossifies. It articulates with the body of the sternum and with the seventh costal cartilage and therefore indirectly to the last of the ribs, that is ribs 8, 9 and 10. It is usually more prominent in the infant and the young. In some individuals, the xiphoid process may be bifid. The clavicles. This is a long horizontal bone connecting the sternum with the scapula. It is an S-shaped strut connecting the superolateral part of the manubrium, just anterior and slightly superior to the first rib. The sternoclavicular joint may be felt with ease if the shoulder is elevated and depressed. The clavicle is convex on the medial two-thirds and concave at the lateral one-third. Find the suprasternal notch and lateral to that is the superior part of the clavicle. Trace the clavicle laterally until you reach the acromioclavicular joint. The transverse process of the atlas. The atlas is located under the condyles of the occipital bone. The transverse process of the atlas are large and project laterally. They are located about one centimeter inferior and slightly anterior to the apex of the mastoid process. Palpate them using your index fingers. Place your fingers inferior to the mastoid processes. Then move them slightly inferiorly and anteriorly. With modest pressure, roll your fingertip over the sternocleidomastoid muscle. When you are over the tip of the transverse process, the patient may experience slight tenderness. The spinous process of C2 to C7. The spinous processes of the cervical vertebrae project posteriorly and slightly inferiorly. They exhibit great variability from person to person. C3, C4, C5 and C6 have smaller variable bifid spinous processes and are embedded deep within the muscles. They are made less accessible by the extended posture of the cervical spine. C7 is by far the most prominent in the cervical spine. Hence, its name, vertebra prominence. It is a useful landmark to orientate your position on the spine. The spinous processes of T1 to T12. The 12 thoracic vertebrae articulate with their respective ribs. 
It is therefore a more rigid region in relation to the cervical spine above and the lumbar section below. The spinous processes of T1 is thick, long and almost horizontal. It is the second most prominent spinous process after C7. The rest of the spinous processes are long and project obliquely downwards. In the midsection of the thoracic spine, the spinous processes are longest and project more inferiorly. Take into consideration that the thoracic spine has a variable anteroposterior curvature. If your subject has an extended thoracic region, in order to expose the spinous processes, ask the patient to flex forward. The spinous processes of T1 to T3 are almost in line with the top of the vertebral body of the segment below. In contrast, the spinous processes of lower segments in the thoracic spine, as they are longer and more vertical, they overlap and are in line with the lower border of the vertebral body of the segment below. The spinous process of T12 being more horizontal and shorter and similar to the lumbar is almost in line with the intervertebral discs of T12 L1 segment. Other surface anatomy landmarks of the thoracic spine. The tip of the spinous process of T3 is in line with the medial end of the spine of the scapula. The spinous process of T7 is at the level of the inferior angle of the scapula. The 12th rib may be traced to locate the 12th vertebra. Alternatively, to locate T12, you can start from landmarks of the lumbar spine below and count the spinous processes upwards. We will see these landmarks further down. These spinous processes of L1 to L5. These spinous processes are thick, broad and almost quadrilateral. They project posteriorly. The lower ones have the thickest spinous processes. The lumbar spinous processes can be palpated in the standing or in the prone position. Placing a pillow under the abdomen flexes the spine slightly, thus exposing and separating the spinous processes. The posterior superior iliac spines can be used as landmarks. These are at the level of the spinous processes of the second sacral vertebrae. The scapula. The superior angle of the scapula is over the second rib. The inferior angle is over the seventh rib. The medial end of the spine of the scapula is between ribs 3 and 4 and is closer to the spine than the superior and inferior angles. The spine of the scapula projects superiorly and laterally and just before the shoulder joint it turns anteriorly to form the acromion process. The acromion process articulates with the clavicle. The joint line is just superior medially to the apex of the glenohumeral joint. It is not easy to feel the limited movements of the acromioclavicular joint. The ribs. The ribs can be palpated with variable ease depending on the subject's morphology. Posteriorly, the ribs of the upper part of the thorax travel laterally in a horizontal direction until the lateral chest. From here, they turn in an anterior and obliquely inferior direction 
towards their costal cartilages. In the inferior part of the thorax, the ribs assume a slightly downward direction as they travel towards the lateral and anterior direction until their costal cartilages. In the anterior thoracic wall, the costal cartilages of ribs 1 to 5 are almost horizontal as they approach the stern. The costal cartilages of ribs 6 to 10 take an increasingly superior direction towards the inferior parts of the sternum. The costal cartilages of ribs 8, 9 and 10 unite together into one process to attach just lateral to the zytosternal joint. To identify the ribs posteriorly, you can follow some key landmarks. You can position the patient prone in a slightly flexed position. Alternatively, in the sitting or standing position with the scapulae protracted and in slight flexion. For the first rib, find the vertebral prominence of C7. The first rib can be palpated about 2 cm laterally and slightly inferiorly to the spinous process of C7. It may not be easy to feel it due to the thickness of the trapezius and levator scapulae muscles. The first rib is almost horizontal. Anteriorly, the first rib is deep to the clavicles. The second rib can be traced with a similar technique, now counting down to the spinous process of T1. It can be palpated about 2 cm laterally and slightly inferiorly to the spinous process of T1. As the rib is traced laterally, it is found to lie under the superior angle of the scapula. Anteriorly, it articulates at the manupriosternal angle or angle of Lewis. You can use a similar technique for the rest of the ribs. The third and fourth ribs are approximately under the medial end of the spine of the scapula. The seventh rib is under the inferior angle of the scapula. Anteriorly and laterally to the lowest costal margin of the thorax, a sharp costal angle is formed by the ninth rib. The costal angle is at the level of the transpyloric plane. Posterior laterally, the costal angle is at the level of the tip of the 12th rib and posteriorly with the level of the spinous process of L1. The tip of the 11th rib is above the 12th rib but more anteriorly just in front of the mid axillary line. The sacrum and sacroiliac joints. The sacrum is a triangular shaped bone made up of five fused vertebrae, convex posteriorly. The broad base articulates with the disc of the fifth lumbar vertebra and inferiorly it is fused with the coccyx deep within the cluteal cleft about two to three centimeters above the anus. Find the superior part of the sacroiliac joints by locating the posterior superior iliac spines. The sacroiliac joints are shaped with a rough concavity on the medial aspect, the coccyx. This forms the terminal part of the sacrum. It is made up of three to five fused vertebrae. Its vertical length shows great individual variability with a combined length of the sacrum and coccyx being about 12 cm. The apex of the coccyx is about 2 to 3 cm above the anus. The sacrococcygeal union may be identified by posterior rough protrusions formed laterally by the coccygeal and sacral cornua or horns. The symphysis pubis. Please note that examination or palpation of intimate areas requires consent or the presence of a chaperone. The symphysis pubis is a midline union of the anterior bony pelvis formed by the pubic bones. The urinary bladder is located just posterior and superior to the symphysis. 
the external genitalia are just below the symphysis pubis. To relax the abdominal wall, place your subject in a supine position with knees in slight flexion. The pubic tubicles can be palpated on either side of the midline cartilage. The rest of the pubic ramus can be traced laterally with your fingertips by tracing the bony margin, filling the soft abdominal wall above, eventually curving upwards towards the ilium.